All right. Uh, welcome to your first class of 8215. This is going to be your introduction to database. Uh, but before we get any further, I'll introduce myself properly. Uh, half of you, well, a third of you kind of met me yesterday uh, quickly. Uh, but a uh, bit of background, why you should listen to me as opposed to, you know, play your favorite game or zone out. Um, I graduated from Canada College in 1996. That's in North Bay, if anybody's curious where that is. Uh, for those of you that don't know where that is, that's three and a half hours northwest of here, up the highway. It's a bit of a drive. Um, I graduated from Computer Program or Analyst Program, specific with business systems. Uh, I've been working as a professional developer ever since. I work full time. I teach part time. Um, I've been teaching for 16, heading on 17 years now. So I've been around the block. Uh, there's very little I have not seen in my classroom at some point. Um, currently working for a company called Cadillac Technology. We're a division of, well, we just got split off again. So technically still EFI. Um, and I'm a web full, uh, full stack web developer. Uh, that means I do everything from designing databases all the way to implementing interfaces, the whole stack. Uh, what kind of person am I? I tend to have a very loose and easy going teaching style. Um, you won't see me with lecture notes of anything of that nature. I do this for a living. I use my PowerPoint slides as things I need to remember to talk about, and that's about it. Um, I didn't create these slides except for the first few. Uh, I have edited them, but they are a shared slide amongst the other sections of this course. So some of the slides I like, some of them I don't. I'll let you guess which ones. You'll probably be able to figure it out pretty quick. Um, I've been known to be sarcastic. Um, you know, we all have our problems. Uh, I also tend to understand that life happens. Uh, you know, life happens. I mean, the last last term, we had a big ice storm like in the first, the second week of class. So that all got messed up. Last year, second week of class of this literally course, we had that big windstorm where half the city got no power for like seven days. Life happens. Uh, you, you end up in the hospital. Life happens. Pass a kidney stone. Been there, done that. A couple of times. Life happens. It's okay. Let me know. Ahead of time, I tend to be pretty easy going. Now, I don't suffer fools in the expression, as they say. So your lap, your dog peed on your laptop three times in a row. That's too bad at that point. I'm only willing to buy, believe so much uh, poor planning. Um, I've been told I'm an equal opportunity offender. In other words, I tend to tease my students in class a little bit. I've tried to tune that back over the years, um, but it happens. So. If I happen to call you out in class, don't feel bad. You're just the victim today. Somebody else will be the victim another day. And it's not meant maliciously. I'm just, it's my sense of humor. Um, we do have a recommended textbook. Um, and if you are in computer programmer, which I think you guys are, because there's two programs taking this course right now, um, you will probably want to go and buy it because you'll need it for level two. So you get to use this textbook for two terms. It's not cheap, but it should be in um, the bookstore. All right, so what can you expect this term? Well, obviously you're gonna get some lectures, uh, 12, uh, roughly 12 of them. Uh, you're gonna have some labs, 10 of those. Uh, you're gonna have assignments, two of those. And a two-part exam. Uh, this course is a little different from some of the others where we have a split final exam uh, in the sense that you get a midterm and you get a final exam, but nothing that's on the midterm is on the final exam. Literally, at, after week seven, we reset for the second exam. So you only need to remember seven weeks worth of stuff at a time, which historically has been significantly more successful for students to actually learn because they're not worrying about trying to remember stuff that they've already been tested on. Uh, labs gradually increase in difficulty. So lab one is a gimme because you're just installing software. 
and towards lab five, it does this, and then lab six shows up, and then does this, and then you got Dark Souls of Lab, also known as Lab Nine. Um, lab Nine is very difficult, but that's life. Um, or at least some students think it is. I can't say it's difficult for everybody. It's just like anything else. Um, assignments and labs submitted via Brightspace. You will always have two weeks to do them. Um, they're not brutal except for lab nine. Uh, so there's no excuses there. Uh, the midterm test will be done in class. So week seven, we will all be sitting here writing a test. Well, I won't be, but you guys will be sitting here writing a test on paper. Thank you, Chat GPT, for that. No, no. I've, last term, we were like one of my other courses I teach. We we're supposed to have our final exam electronically. Two weeks before the exam, the edict came from uh, down high that uh, all exams are on paper uh, because they busted fifteen students in one class using Chat GPT in the middle of a test. So they're like, sucks to suck. Um, so. All tests are on paper, like actual tests are on paper. It was going to be anyways, but this just can put the final nail in that one. Okay, so you're going to learn three things this term. Um, you're going to learn about design and modeling. Those two go hand in hand. And you're going to learn about SQL. SQL comes after the break. So you're going to learn about design and modeling for the first half of the term, then SQL for the second half of the term. It is um, a course that goes at a fairly brisk, brisk pace. It goes pretty quick um, because there's a lot of content to cover and not a lot of time. There should be lots of time to cover. We put in padding to make sure that, you know, if anything happens, we don't lose too much time. Um, so you're gonna learn about basic database design. Um, actually, I forgot to update this slide, bad Dan. Um, you're gonna learn about SQL. You're gonna learn about views, but you're not gonna learn about triggers and stored procedures. That's actually your level two database course. Uh, it used to be part of this course. I just forgot to update the slide. Okay, so your grade breakdown is as follows. Your labs are worth 25% of your grade. Easy math, 2.5% of every lab counts towards your final grade. Hybrids are 10%, uh, there's four of them. So roughly 10% divided by four will give you your hybrid grade. Um, there's two assignments worth 30% of your grade. Uh, the assignments, just so you know, the R group work for all the fun that involves. Um, I am not gonna deal with the politics. The midterm is 15%, your final exam is 30%. Um, that's just how the breakdown goes. Um, so few, as in read none, except for the very first lab, uh, require an in-person submission. First lab, you demo to us so that we know that the software is working on your machine. We give you a grade. We, that means we know the software works on your machine. And therefore, if your software doesn't work on week two, well, that's more your problem than our problem. Um, as I said, the midterm currently is planned to be on paper and in person. Uh, who knows what happens in seven weeks from now? Uh, when COVID started with whatever, four years ago, first week was like, everything's on paper. Week six, guess what? We're all learning from home now. So, you know, we can't guarantee everything. Uh, assignment one and two, submission of files on Brightspace. And as things proceed, more details will be forthcoming, obviously. So Cal students, I make a point of pointing out Cal at this stage. Um, students who need special considerations regarding assessments, contact Cal, they're there to help you. Uh, that's the Center for Accessible Learning. Whether you are, you have AD, ADD, ADHD, take your pick there. You know, you have a learning disability of some sort. Insert other medical reason why you need extra time for a test or you need to take a test in a quiet area, et cetera, et cetera. And they, they've actually got some pretty fantastic resources. Um, my daughter's doing her co-op. She took a different program here. She's in the middle of her co-op and she's milked Cal for all it's worth. 
milk it for everything it, you can get. Like, it's worth it. Um, so if you do have assessments or uh, accommodations through Cal, send me a letter. And for the midterm and the final exam, you got to book ahead of time because you can't just walk the same day and say, I'm going to write my test here today. That's not how it works. Um, so absolutely, if you can, if you can use Cal, use it, it's worth it. Um, they're on the third floor, one, two, yeah, third floor of the student commons. So this is a 323 course. Uh, it means there's three hours of theory in class, one hour online. Realistically, that one hour online really isn't an hour every week. Uh, it's only like an hour when you're panicking that you forgot to do the hybrids. And then you'll spend an hour or two that one week doing some hybrids. It, it is what it is. Uh, there's two hours of lab and three hours of study time. This is what technically the course expects from you. That three hours of study time, realistically, for a lot of people, I'd say for half of you, probably won't be three hours a week. It might be an hour. Some of you might be negative three hours because you won't even come to class. But the assumption is that you will have up to three hours of studying a week. All right, so Dan's rules for success in this course. Come to lecture. That's probably the most important one. Um, however, I do not take attendance. You've noticed I'm wearing a headset, and it's not to project my voice. Um, I'll explain that in a moment. Uh, do your work, obviously. If you don't do your homework, don't do your assignments, we have nothing to give you grades on. Therefore, if I've got nothing to grade, you make my life very easy. How long do you think it takes me to put in a zero? About, oh, uh, about a second. Uh, hand in your work on time. Uh, if you're a week late, it's a 10% penalty. More than two weeks, you get the automatic goose egg. It's an automatic zero. Again, that is easy for me. I'm not a harsh prof, but I don't, I'm not scared to give zeros for people that don't do their work. Um, if you don't hear me assign it in class, then it's not due. That's a, a weird statement. There used to, our old LMS had a habit of changing due dates on things automatically at night when nobody was using it. So as a rule of thumb, I always say, if you don't actually hear me mention it in class, then it's not due. Specifically talking about the assignments. The labs are due every two weeks. They're in the calendar in bright space. You can, when you log in, you look at the course calendar, you can see all the assessments when they're due. It's not a mystery. Um, the last point, uh, just ignore the fact that it says start of the next lecture. You actually have two weeks to do them now. Um, that was the last decision that was made at the last group teacher meeting for this course, because there's uh, seven of us teaching this course. And that was a consensus. I just didn't have a chance to update my slides before I came in today. All right, so the official to pass the course, you must write the final exam. It doesn't say you have to pass the final exam. You have to write the final exam. You come in, you put your name on the Scantron sheet, and you answer one question, you wrote the exam. And yes, I've had a student do that. They just wanted to pass the course, and they were done giving um, something at that point. You must get 50% on tests and exams combined, and then 50% on assignments and group work. So in other words, you have to have 50% on your hybrids, midterm, and final exam and 50% on your the combined grade for your two assignments and your labs. You must pass both components independently. It is what it is, right? So you must pass the test, the theory, you must pass the practical. You fail one, depending how close the fail is, you might still pass, but if you really fail one, then, you know, it is what it is. Okay, supported hardware and software. Windows laptops. The course outline, the course requirements as a Windows computer um, with at least 8 gigs of RAM, preferably 16. Really, the price differential isn't that high. Mac users, theoretically, you can run this course on Mac. Next semester, not so much. So it's going to be an interesting ride for you Mac users. Um, 
And I know almost nothing about Max. So if you're in my lab section, you've already heard my two minute spiel about how I feel about Max. Um, Linux users, knock yourselves out. I can absolutely help you. I literally live and breathe Linux all day. Windows is the exception for me. Okay, check your email once a day. If you're gonna reply or email me, send it from your Algonquin Live email address. Don't send it to me from your Gmail, your QQ, your insert other email service here. 50-50 chance the Algonquin email system will just mark it right into my spam bin and I'll never even notice I got it until I go digging through my spam bin. I've had one student complain to the coordinator that I didn't answer his emails. Coordinator says, have you gotten any emails? No, I checked the spam bin. Oh yeah, he did email me. I don't check my spam bin. I get too many emails as it is between my day job and this, that I don't go hunting for people's emails. So send it from Algonquin Live. It automatically goes to my mailbox. It's a good idea. So don't send messages from Brightspace. There's a very good chance it's not gonna reach. Yes, you can actually message people in Brightspace. And there's a 55th chance that will work. So we say, just don't. Um, always include your name. And include your name the way you have it in Brightspace. You know how in Brightspace, you can adjust what your name looks like? Make sure it matches what Brightspace has. Because, you know, you might have a name that's this long and you call yourself Bob. And I'm not, you say Bob, and I don't see Bob in the student list. I wonder who you are. And then I end up saying, who are you? So include your name as it appears in Brightspace as much as possible, uh, your student number. And if it has to do with labs, include your section number so I know who it is I'm talking to. So lecture recording. I'm one of the freaks that records their lectures. Probably the only one this term for you guys. Um, I do it as a value added service. It's not guaranteed. I don't get paid to record the lectures or to rip the render, the video, any of that. I just do it because in the past it has saved my bacon and it gives you guys a chance to go back, look at what I said in class. For those of you whose English is not their first language and looking at the crowd in here, English as a first language is a minority by far. Holy cow, I think we're outnumbered a lot this term. and. It's all good. I don't care, but what it's going to do is, is if I say something you didn't catch in class, you'll be able to go back and rewatch the lecture as needed. Um, usually it's uploaded to YouTube within one or two days. Historically, it was the same day, but this term they've got me with back-to-back -back lectures. So I've got a lecture now, and then at four o'clock, I've got a lecture. Sorry, at uh, six o'clock, I've got a lecture. So it's not happening today. Um, so odds are it'll be up at some point tomorrow. Uh, there is a YouTube channel, but I'll provide a link right in Brightspace for every lecture I do. Um, and you'll also happen to notice that um, if you happen to go to my YouTube channel, you'll uh, see all my old lectures going back like seven years. Or even other courses. That's not this one. I just have them all up there. Okay, so that's the course intro. Does anybody have any questions before actually dive into today's today's lecture material. Groups of two or three, they must be the same group, the members must be in your lab section. That'll be covered in more detail when I hand you set assignments. Um, but yeah, that's not It has to be, it has to be in your lab. Because the problem is that we have three lab instructors this term, myself, LM, and Wander. And when that happens, we can't have students from one lab section participating in a group to another lab section because you're not our student, so I'm not allowed to evaluate you. But if you go the other way around, they're not allowed to evaluate you and we're not gonna evaluate the same assignment twice. So the assignments are due per lab section. It is what it is. Any other questions? Going once, going twice. Okay, sold.
Now, you'll notice my name is not on the slide. I didn't write this slide, these slides. Uh, Sandra is the person in charge of this course at Current. In other words, she provides all the content for it um, with my input, but she provides the content for it. Okay, um, so today's lecture is going to be an info dump. It always is. The first couple of lectures are always an information dump. There is always a fair amount of information that we just need to front load, so to speak, to get, you know, things out of the way. Um, but essentially, we're just going to talk about databases in general and describe what what's what. Okay, so realistically, everything you do, no matter what it is, interacts with a database. There is very little in your life that's not tied to a database of some sort. Whether you're using your laptop to access Brightspace, you're using your phone to play the latest gacha game, you know, it all goes back to a database somewhere. You pull out your Switch, playing, you know, Pokemon on the go, and you logged into the Nintendo service, congratulations, you interacted with a database. Uh, odds are there's a web server or an application server sitting there communicating between your you and the database server. But they essentially, yeah. So you interact with the device, the device sends a message, something at the other end receives the message, talks to the database, database replies, application replies, and you found out that your luck sucked today on your gadget pull. He's interacting with the database. <laughs> uh, YouTube has a really big database. So a database is an organized collection of logically related uh, data. Um, so the goal is that you collect information, organize it, convert it into something called data. And a database itself is referred to as a self-describing collection of integrated tables. Now, that's a really long sentence. And what that basically means is that a database describes itself. So you have a database server, regardless of the software that is running it. So whether it's MySQL, Oracle, Microsoft SQL Server, PostgreSQL, whatever it is, that's the server software. The database itself is self-describing as in, the information that tells the server how data is organized is contained inside that database. Just like technically you are a self-described object. Your DNA defines who you are. Well, what you are, not who you are. It defines what you are. You're tall, you're short, you're round, you're skinny. Take your pick. Your DNA probably has to do with that because you are self-describing. A database is similar. The database self-describes. It knows how to store the data in a certain way. The tables are called integrated uh, because they contain information and they also contain the interconnection between different database objects. So in this case, if I were going to talk about two kinds of objects in this room, you'd have students, you'd have professor. There is a relationship between the two of us, and the odds are there's a database table somewhere that describes how we're connected. So it's integrated because each object is aware of the other. The database is called self-describing because it stores a description of itself, as I just said. And the self-describing data is known as metadata. For those of you that don't know what metadata is, it's data about data. So in other words, we have data in here that identifies us. We have our name, we have our addresses, our date of birth, you know, insert random gender here, take your pick. However, every student in here has the same data structure as far as the school is concerned. That's the data about the data. So the data is you, but there's data that describes you to the school systems. So that's the metadata. It is information that describes how information is stored. 
And that first point we just already covered. Um, and I covered this too. I don't know why we have repeated slides in here again. Um, databases are everywhere, obviously. Uh, the effects on our daily lives is extensive. Um, you might be really surprised on just how much of your life is in a database somewhere. Or actually by now you should not be surprised at just how much of your life is in a database somewhere. Um, I'm sure most of us stream video of some sort. Whether you got Hulu or Netflix or, you know, Disney Plus or, you know, insert every other imaginable Amazon Prime. At one point we could just say Netflix and we were done, but now there's, you know, dozens um, of services and they track your preferences, all that kind of stuff. You have an account. You watch stuff, they know what you watch, they start doing recommendations, uh, they listen to music, you know, good old Spotify, Spotify knows who you are, Spotify knows me way too well. And most of this is stored in specialized database engines, not general purpose database engines. Uh, what you guys are gonna be learning this term is general purpose database engines, such as MySQL and Oracle. Um, there's very specialized ones like Cassandra. The There's personal cloud storage. Um, we probably all have, well, actually you all have at least a, uh, an Office 365 account, thanks to Algonquin, right? You have OneDrive. There's a database behind OneDrive. If you've got Google and you use Google Drive, you've got to draw another database behind that. That's, you know, there's a database behind that because they, they need to know who has access to what files, whatever. They just store the files on a disk somewhere. And your file might be right next to somebody else's file, but you can't see them, but the database knows where they are. Uh, sports. I'm sure there's people in here that watch uh, soccer, also known as football or cricket or hockey or insert other preferred sports here, baseball. Uh, if there's a single sport on earth that has too many statistics, it's baseball. And sports leagues track stats. Where's the stats stored? In a database. They can run a query and see a person's average of their career. They can see the win-loss ratios for given kinds of sports. It's all in a database. Uh, finances. Anybody who doesn't think a bank uses a database is fooling themselves. The only bank not using a database is your wallet. Banks, historically, have been the institution that has pushed the envelope of database the fastest. Right along with governments. Governments want to know everything about you. Banks want to know everything about your money. Um... Like I'm at an age where I could see the transformation of how banking changed. Right when I started college, we still had passbooks. ATMs were kind of new. They'd only been around for like five or six years, at least in my hometown. Man, that makes me feel old. But I remember, you know, I need to pull out money. I'd have to go to the teller and say, here's my bank book. Give me some money. No questions asked. They just gave you money if your bank book said you had money. It's kind of cool. And each bank contained its own copy of the data. At night, it would replicate the data to some other data center. And that's how banking happened. And then ATMs started showing up and suddenly you could go use an ATM in another town to withdraw money, but it had to talk to a database. But you know, there were still times where if she deposited money, even if it was cash at the teller, it would take 24 hours where you could use your money in another town because the data had to be copied somewhere. Uh, nowadays, it's like, but I'm going McDouble. It's like, I don't even need to pull up my wallet or just tap my phone on the way by. I have, you know, my coffee, the same color as my soul. That's black, by the way. Um, database in banking has really sped things up. And because they want so much, it has improved everything else. We just got to 
enjoy it. Uh, currently, honestly, financial transactions is probably the highest volume of data transfer in the world right now. Uh, the world runs on money. Uh, don't let anybody fool you that it does not. Um, it runs on money and literally, I, th I read a stat recently that close to 12% uh, of the internet's traffic is financial transactions. 25% is porn. The rest of it is pretty much everything else. I mean, I don't make the stats. It's just life. Maybe depending on where you're from, it might not be that percentage, but, you know, North America it definitely is. There have been organizations, but we know governments track you. Um, a lot. <laughs> In some parts of the world, more than others. Some places they have social credits. They have that in the States too, and they're trying to get that in the States too. So, you know, the Americans get to live with that system too. In Canada, the CRA, the CRA knows everything they need to know about you. They know where you were, they know how much you made. They know all your medical receipts. They have, you know, your student stuff. Um, the Employment Services, uh, HRDC, Human Resources Canada also knows a lot about you because they know where you're working. They get the information for that. Government tracks a lot of information about you. Social media. Facebook. Yeah. Uh, Instagram. You know, whatever the shit show is that is Twitter now. There's lots and lots of databases behind all that social media stuff. E-commerce, go back to talking about money. Yeah, Amazon, they know everything about you. Healthcare, that is actually one of the slowest ones to adopt database properly. Surprise, surprise, healthcare does not like change. But they are changing. And in Ontario, it's gone to the point where it's pretty close now, where if you go to one hospital, and then you go to another hospital, they can still pull up your medical records for what they did to you at another hospital. But the hospital does not have access to my records from my doctor's office yet. Go figure that one out. But each hospital has insanely large databases. They track absolutely everything about you while you're there. Um, it's good because they're using a lot less paper than they used to. I remember, I remember a few years ago when I was in the hospital and my one six hour visit generated that much paper. Last time I was there, it generated three sheets of paper, two of which were prescriptions for me as I walked out the door. So, you know, databases are improving some other things. Uh, weather, well, we track weather. Lots of, lots of numbers when it comes to weather. And they use, they put everything in a database and then they try to predict the weather. They still can't do it right. At least they try. And the pretty much everything behind the scenes is using some popular database engine, whether it's MySQL, Microsoft SQL Server, uh, Cassandra, which is a high speed uh, key indexed pair database engine, Oracle, you know, all those things. Okay. So now we talked about how. Everybody knows everything about you, even if you're trying to hide. We're going to talk about uh, the characteristics of a relational database. Now, the purpose of a database, if you haven't figured it out yet, is to track things. You're going to track numbers, you're going to track names, you're going to track addresses, basically you're tracking information. And it is, databases are basically fall under one of two categories broadly, relational and non-relational. A relational database is a database like what you guys are going to be learning this term. The concepts were established in the 60s, developed in the 70s, rolled out early 70s, and honestly, things have not changed that much. The technology and how fast they are and that kind of stuff has improved. The concepts have not changed. I could use the original slides from my database courses and when I went through school, when I took my first database course in 95, and I could probably teach this course with it. That's how little it has changed. It doesn't mean 
you're learning outdated technology. It just means that they actually did it right when they designed the concepts. Now what they're doing is they're refining. Every couple of years, they come out with some new things, but they just basically fine-tuning, refining, making it better. Um, just like computers are getting better. I don't know how many of you remember what laptops were like in the early 2000s. Uh, calling them laptops was a really generous term. They're more like boat anchors. And now, you know, I have this 16-inch laptop that weighs three pounds. It's been refined. Does it do anything more than the laptop did, you know, early 2000s? No, not really. Well, it does it better, but it's just a refined, it's just added features to something that already worked. And then there's something called non-relational. So this is where the whole no SQL thing comes in and Cassandra comes in, the key value pair database engines, ledger style databases. These are databases that are targeted for a very specific purpose. They do a very specific thing and you're not gonna learn about them in this course. Because every single non-relational database engine does things its own way. So you'll have people say, oh, what about MongoDB? Congratulations, MongoDB. It does whatever MongoDB does. Cassandra does its own thing. It does it completely different. Therefore, there's nothing, there's no common ground between different non-relational database engines. They all serve a very specific purpose. And you have to learn what the purpose is and learn how to use that tool for that purpose. So you might get a job where they're using Mongo. Great, you're going to learn how to use Mongo. There's no SQL in Mongo. Large data sets are referred to as big data. In other words, it's just big piles and piles of data in a database somewhere. So every time you hear the phrase big data, it just means that they accumulated a pile of data. That's it. Nothing more, nothing less. It's just lots and lots of data. Uh, one of the companies I worked for 10 years ago-ish, uh, 14 years ago, I guess now, um, we had something called big data and our, the MySQL database backups were in the, uh, somewhere around 10 to 12 gigabytes. That, do you guys think at ah, 12 gigs, it's not that big. That's like quarter the size of modern warfare too. No problem. But when you think about the fact that database, all that's in there is literally pure data. It's a lot. Um, yeah. All right, so in a relational database, which is what well, we're going to focus us on this term, data is stored in something called tables, which have rows, which are known as records, and columns, which are also known as fields. How many of you here have used a spreadsheet, whether it's Excel or Google Sheets or whatever the frig it is on a Mac, Numbers? I think it's called on a Mac because, you know, they're original. But you know what I'm talking about. You've got rows. You've got columns. Each row is a collection of columns. That's a database table in its purest, simplest concept. Data is not actually stored like that in the database, but when you look at it, that's roughly what you're thinking of, is you're thinking about row columns, which have specific pieces of data, and the row is a collection of each column. So if you've worked with an Excel spreadsheet, congrats, you know what a table roughly looks like how it roughly behaves. A database may have multiple tables. Honestly, if you're creating a database and, and you start up a database server with only one table in it, you're really doing things wrong. Because you should not only, uh, there's no real reason to have a database server for one table. You probably should use something other than a relational database. And in this database, you'll have multiple tables. Each table stores information about something different. If I go back to talking about here at the school, Access. Okay, you guys have all been logged into Access at least once by now. Access is old, really old. And in Access, there's information about students, there's information about your courses, there's information about programs and um, that kind of stuff. There's information about profs. 
literally each of those, each co a course is a table, a student is a table, like students are a table, professors are a table. All of these are all in the same database, but they're contained in separate bins because they are different things. Each row in the table stores information about an occurrence or the proper term, an instance of a thing of interest. So back to my student table example. So in Access, we have a table for students. This table probably has your name, your address, your phone number, your student number, uh, some unique government issued ID number. So, you know, Canadian students probably has your SIN number. International students, it probably has your student visa number, your passport number, or something else. I really don't know what they collect for each of you. Everybody in the system has the same data. However, each of you are an instance of that data. In other words, each of you are a separate record in the database. So you're all unique instances of a student, which is contained in a database table that contains students. So this table has a bunch of students in it. Each student is an instance. An instance is a collection of every field or one individual. And a database stores data and relationships. In other words, the data from each of you would be your name, your date of birth, your address, that kind of thing. And then it also store relationships. What courses are you enrolled in? What professors are teaching these courses? That's all in Access. So they use Access to figure out that I'm supposed to be here talking to you today, at this time, in T130. That's all in Access. All that is determined by a database. Somebody hits a button and magically shuffles everything around and it figures it out. So that's what it stores. So this is one where these two phrases tend to be used interchangeably, I guess, not quite right. So there's data and information. Data is recorded facts. So there's, in things are collected, they're put in the database, it becomes data. Information is the one where people argue about where is where does information come from? Some people say, well, information is the stuff that's derived from the data. In other words, it's a report. It's your profile when you log into Access and you need to, you know, pay your student fees, whatever. Um, you know, there's some math, you owe this much money, that kind of thing. Uh, that's what they call information in the sense of output from a database. However, information is also often referred to as the stuff before it gets into the database. And you can think of it as in, um, one is raw information, one is refined information. So the raw information is out there. So for example, you just, you're about to register with the school. So you're going to provide your name, your address. At that point, this is raw information. There, you know way more about you, yourself, than the school needs to know, right? When you go start filling in the applications, I haven't applied to school in, you know, 28, 29 years, so it's a little vague. But when you apply, you fill out a bunch of forms and they ask you very specific things about you. They ask, you know, your name, your date of birth, a few other things, some contact information, that kind of stuff, what courses you're interested in. Um, and that is raw information, unprocessed information. They might not care that you have a dog called Poodle, for a lack of a better name. They don't care. That's raw information about you that the school doesn't care. The process of it, the raw information turning into data gets rid of anything they don't care about. They don't care about that information. They don't care what you had for breakfast that day. They don't care that you can't draw, drink coffee, you can only drink tea on the third Monday of every month. They don't care. But they do care about the information that has to do with them. 
when it's turned into data and they run some reports on it, now it becomes refined information. You can think of it as in when you are preparing food. Bananas on the tree. That's raw information. Banana gets picked and it's sitting on your counter. It's data. You slice your banana, slap it on bread with peanut butter. It's refined data. I don't like that myself, but you know, I was just trying to think of the one thing that would work that I've seen my daughter do. And it's, you know, but it is the process, right? Where you got the raw information, it turns into data, and then you got to refine information on the other side. Databases record data. They do it in such a way that we can produce information. And data, for example, for students' classes and grades can produce information about each student's GPA. Because if we know what your grades are, we can figure out what your GPA is. If we know what your grades are, we know if you're allowed to go to level two or not. It's pretty straightforward. So a database system is made up of four things. Users. These are the people interacting with the application. Comes as a shock, but there's actually got to be someone that types the stuff in. Or somebody that looks at the reports or somebody that clicks on the buttons. There is often a database application. That is the piece of software that you interact with. Access, Brightspace, whatever other, you know, your bank, you load up your little banking app and, you know, pull a BMO and they can see how much money you spent last week at Starbucks. You go, wow. That's the application. There's a database management system. So that's the database server, Microsoft SQL Server, Oracle, MySQL, insert other database engine here. What its purpose is, is to take requests from the application, process them, and then actually talk to the database to extract the records out of it. The files that make up a database are not compatible from one, you can't take the files from MySQL and pop them to Oracle, because that's not going to work. You have to convert them. But the application asks the DBMS, the DBMS talks to the database, grabs the data, gives it back to the application, which then gives it to the user. Those are the four pieces. And the database itself, when we use the word database here, is we are talking about an organized set of data, not we're not talking about MySQL itself. We're not talking about Oracle. We're talking about what's actually stored inside the DBMS. The DBMS is an application. It has things inside of it. That's the database, the thing inside of it. The database management system allows things on the outside to retrieve data from inside of it. How many of you have a safety deposit box? Probably almost nobody in this room. How many of you know what a safety deposit box is? Only those of a certain vintage probably even think of it. Safety deposit box is you go to the bank, you can rent a safety deposit box to keep important things out of your house in the safety of a bank. Theoretically safe. And if you can picture that the database management system is the bank, the safety deposit box is the database. You have to go through the bank to get to your safety deposit box, to get your, to the contents of that safety deposit box. That's, you know, basically what the DBMS does. And if you don't know what a safety deposit box is, go look it up. It's interesting. Uh, it used to be a lot more common than it is now because most of us have all our important documents in the cloud out there somewhere. Microsoft has it. Amazon has it. Oracle has it. Somebody's got it. It's just not you. Okay. so. Most relational database systems have a language called SQL. Uh, it's internationally recognized standard language. All relational database systems, to the best of my knowledge, support it. They don't all support the exact same parts of it, typical, but there is a standard that they all have. And as time progresses, the standard, they keep adding things to the standard and the database servers usually ignore the things they add to the standard. 
uh, because nobody really needs them, but they just keep coming up with things they can add on. But SQL is the language, which is what you guys are going to learn after the break. Um, the DBMS I talked about already, the database application, I talked about that already. Um, so the visual way of this is that users talk to the application, application talks to the database server. It takes care of all the bits and pieces. It's like the, it's like the teller at the bank. They decide if you're allowed to go open up your safety deposit box to get your stuff out. Um, they make sure that the doors are locked when they, you leave, that kind of thing. And then, you know, there's the database. Now, a database, a system that's got SQL just injects the SQL right in the middle. So the ad database application generates SQL commands. It sends the SQL command to the DBMS. DM DBMS does its magic sauce. It returns information to the application and then magic ensues. Um, SQL is literally the language for database. There are, if you're talking about things like MongoDB or NoSQL databases, they have a language, but not really. They just have different ways of doing the same thing. Um, in here, you will notice that we're not talking about anything like COBOL or Progress or any of the what they call a 4GL, the fourth generation languages, because there is no application SQL or DBMS. Oracle, not Oracle, I mean COBOL is all three in one. And it has its own language. It doesn't have SQL, it has its own querying language. Um, so applications are the programs you use, Brightspace. Uh, DBMS creates, processes, and administers the database. That's what you use to manage the database. Uh, that could be as much as an app, uh, the MySQL Workbench, which those of you that have had lab have installed. Um, great. It also makes sure that it does all the talking as needed, et cetera, et cetera. And SQL, we've already discussed. So we have multi user database applications. Um, Common ones are CRMs and ERPs. Uh, for those of you that don't know what those are, um, CRMs are ways companies use to track communications with their customers. Uh, one of the really common ones is salesforce.com. So you may have heard salesforce.com before. Um, basically put, they put customer information, it has automated tools to help you talk to your customers that kind of thing. ERPs are also basically accounting systems uh, on steroids, but they manage invoices, they manage inventory, they manage purchasing, they, that kind of stuff. Uh, E-commerce companies use web activity databases, obviously. Um, Shopify, that's an example of a multi-user database application. Um, reporting and data mining, uh, those tools do not generate new data. They just summarize what exists. It's used for future planning, for predictions, uh, budgeting, that kind of thing. Um, Ottawa used to have a really good uh, two companies that dealt in that. And one was bought by IBM and the other one just died. Um, for those of us that are, that are at least have been in Ottawa long enough, probably remember a company called Cognos. Uh, they got bought by IBM, oh, 12, 13 years ago, but they were one of the Ottawa's crowning jewels of technology, along with uh, Mitel, Alcatel, and Nortel. How many of these are still around? None. But uh, reporting engines are still there. They just keep getting rebranded. IBM's got its own. Uh, it is what it is. Okay. So just a slide full of information. I'm not going to go through every data point in here, um, but I'm going to pick a few at, at random. Um, the second one from the top is the uh, patient appointment. It probably has somewhere between 10 to 50 
50 users, depending on the size of your doctor's office. Like my family doctor is part of a medical group and they have, you know, something like 10 doctors and half a dozen nurses and, you know, stuff. Um, they probably have hundreds of thousands of rows. Uh, a CRM for a big company could be 10 to tens of millions of rows. Uh, an ERP could be tens of millions of rows. Um, E-commerce sites. Big, the big ones have billions upon billions of rows. I mean, how many rows of data do you think Amazon has? It's stupid how much data they have. Um, you have things like digital da dashboards and data mining. Uh, these are stuff used by managers and business uh, and analysts. They'll have hundreds of thousands of rows too, if not millions. It all depends on what they need to do. Um, so the application, in this case, we can go back to talk, we can talk, use Brightspace as our example, or we could use um, Access as another example. The application itself will create forms and process the forms. So, you know, you go to a, to a web page and it asks you to register and it pops up a form. We've all filled out forms online. The application generates that form. When you submit, it takes the data you typed in and converts it into something that can then be put into the database. Um, it processes user queries. Good example, you launch your banking app and you look at your transactions for the last 30 days. Guess what? That was a query. You wanted to know everything that happened in the last 30 days. It can create and process reports. Again, back to your banking app. You know when you ask it to show you the transactions for the last 30 days, and then it shows you a list of transactions for the last 30 days? That's a report. It ran the request, sent it to the database server, it processed it, generated a report, and showed it to you in a way that you can probably understand. It can execute application logic. It can log you in, log you out of your banking app. You can transfer money. You can send an e-transfer. These are all pieces of application logic. You can pay a bill. And of course, obviously, the application can control itself by shutting itself down, logging out, you know, maintenance windows, that kind of thing. So database servers. Um, so currently, these percentages are really odd. Because often companies have multiple database engines installed at the same time, which is why you'll suddenly see that, you know, there's overlap between these numbers. So Microsoft SQL Server it is installed in 60 to 90% of corporations. The thing is, people say, well, I don't know, why, why do you think we have that installed? And you literally install Visual Studio. So you're a programmer, you install Visual Studio, bam, you got SQL Server, end of story, it's done. But SQL Server is, basically if you work any kind any, inside of any kind of Microsoft environment, Microsoft SQL Server will probably be somewhere in there. Oracle, uh, they're on 40 to 80%. Do you notice that really wide range? Um, that's because nobody actually knows how many clients Oracle has. So. There's often times where you have Microsoft SQL Server and Oracle in the same organization. They just serve different purposes. Um, Oracle's numbers are not getting any bigger. Oracle's growth has been flat for the last 10 years. They just get money from customers they already have. Oracle is stupid expensive and people have been trying to find ways off of Oracle. One of the cheapest ways off Oracle is literally using something like Amazon Web Services, they have a database service that includes Oracle. So instead of giving money to Oracle, they give it to Amazon instead. But it happens instead of costing them $100,000 a year, it costs them $10,000 a year. You know, you gotta decide how you wanna spend your money. Uh, MySQL, um, theoretically, it's 80% of businesses. And unfortunately, yes, it is in 80% of businesses. Um, if you've gone to a website, it's probably talking to MySQL. 
Anything that uses WordPress is using MySQL. Anything that uses Joomla is using MySQL. Facebook has a custom version of MySQL running behind the scenes for itself. MySQL is almost everywhere. IBM DB2 has significantly smaller numbers, uh, 15 to 30%. Now, IBM DB2 is really cool. Don't get me wrong. It's a fantastic database engine. It'll run on your all the way from your phone to a mainframe. And literally the same code will run on your phone as it would on the mainframe. Obviously, the mainframe can handle a lot more than your phone can, but it's everywhere. But it is mostly used by governments and banks. Why? Because they go and they buy an IBM Mini computer, not a microcomputer, a personal computer, a Mini, which is, you know, kind of chunky. Or they also got supercomputers and the mainframes. Um, odds are, if you have an IBM mainframe, you're running DB2 because it just comes with it. Uh, and then we have our last one here, Postgres, uh, at 15%. Postgres is by far the best open source database engine, period, bar none. It is the number one go-to for people trying to get off Oracle because it is 90% compatible with Oracle. Postgres has been around forever. Um, actually, Access here at the school runs on Postgres's ancestor. So there was something before Postgres. It's called Ingress. And Access runs on Ingress here at the school. Um, how many of you have a PlayStation? Okay, I'll admit it. I'm not shy. I've got a PlayStation. Okay. You know when you log into your PlayStation, it authenticates against a Postgres database. Sony uses Postgres as the back end. So the Sony store for your PlayStation, that's running on Postgres. Your stats, all your achievements, all that, that's all in Postgres. Fantastic. Um, Postgres is good. Postgres is fast. It's picking up speed. A lot of government agencies are now adopting it instead of buying new Oracle licenses. They're using Postgres instead. Uh, that 15% that is slowly going up. It's eating into Oracle and Microsoft SQL Server. It's been around forever. I mean, it's been around for 20 years. It's just it used to be really difficult to get set up. Nowadays, it's easier to install than MySQL. There's just people learn MySQL in school, so they use MySQL. Uh, Non-relational, you got MongoDB, uh, Hadoop, Cassandra, uh, React, Couchbase. Um, as you can see, the percentages here are significantly lower. Uh, they serve a very single purpose. They do one job, and they kind of do it right and well, uh, but only if you wrote your code properly. Uh, if you wrote shitty code, you got a shitty database. Okay, so this is an example of a form. Uh, you guys know what forms look like. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on it. Um, this is an example of what SQL looks like. This is what you're going to be learning after the break. Um, Essentially, what we're doing here is we're requesting a person's name and email address from a student database for anybody who's got a number greater than two. And if you were interacting with the database directly, it would give it to you in a grid that looks like a spreadsheet. You have a row and you've got a column. This is a report. You guys know what reports look like. You just look at your banking app. You know exactly what a report looks like. Um, Database applications uh, execute appropriate logic, whatever the logic may be. You guys are computer programming students. You're going to learn about Java. Uh, one of your later courses, I think in level two or three, you actually interact with a database of some sort. Um, basically put, you write code. The code does things. It may ask the database server to do various tasks, add a record, delete a record, that kind of stuff. And it controls the application to make sure that only things that are allowed happen, um, controls activity, that kind of stuff. So the DBMS has a lot of functionality built into it. It allows you to create databases, allows you to create tables, uh, create supporting structures. Pink, 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 pink. Um, 
It allows you to modify the data. So you're going to insert, update, or delete data. So you're going to add new data. You're going to change the data. You're going to get rid of the data. Um, it obviously, it'll read the database data because what's the point of having a database engine if you can't read what's in it? Um, it maintains database structures, nightly maintenance, that kind of thing. Uh, it enforces rules if you create rules at the database level. Uh, it controls concurrency. Now, that's the big one. Um, different database engines handle that one differently. So concurrency means when more than one thing is happening at once. For example, I suddenly say everybody has to leave now. People get up. The doors are controlling concurrency. There's only so many things that can go through that door, right, and that door. The doors are basically controlling concurrency. In other words, they're only allowing so many things to happen at once. Database servers allow thousands of actions to happen at once. And it manages which one finishes first. It manages who's allowed to do what. If two people are trying to edit the same thing at the same time, it decides who's allowed to do it, which change is applied, that kind of thing. That's concurrency, when things happen at the same time. Uh, it performs backups and recovery. Um, in other words, it makes a copy of the data, and theoretically, you can restore this copy back to a usable state. You hope you can restore it to a usable state. Uh, so that's backup and recovery. So Microsoft Access. Microsoft Access is what's known as a personal database system. It runs on your computer. It is a low-end product. It's designed for individual users and sometimes small work groups. Access does not handle concurrency very well at all. Uh, it supports it, but it doesn't do it well. It hides most of the technology behind the scenes by providing you nice tools to create forms. It does it for you automatically. Uh, it maintains a lot of the work for you. It's a good place for beginners, um, but it's not for database professionals. Like, honestly, nothing, access shouldn't even exist anymore, but it does. Um, mostly, You'll get people that know a little bit about computers that need to track a piece of information and they don't want to get their IT department to set it up right. That's what Access is for. Um, so Access provides forms and reports and queries, and it manages everything else. There's nothing magical in there. It's just what it does. Uh, enterprise class applications are a different story. Um, so you'll have applications running over the corporate network. You'll have an e-commerce site. You'll have a portal. Um, you may have some application uh, web services and maybe even a mobile app. And each of those will use SQL to talk to the database server. And they'll all work at the same time. Like for example, the company I work for uh, during the day, um, the main database engine or service that we have has a tool to let us configure software for our customers. Um, we have a tool so that we can ship software to our customers. Uh, customers can register their software. Uh, we have uh, reporting tools for people in tech support and whatnot to try to identify what issues are. All of those are different applications running side by side, all talking to the same database. The database engine makes sure which one's doing what so that we don't damage the data. Um, there's an API endpoint where, you know, somebody launches their desktop software. It asks the endpoint, hey, is the software allowed to run today? Are they running a pirated copy? Have they paid us this month if it's a subscription service? That kind of thing. Um, we don't have any mobile apps. Just not our market. Um, so that's, you know, the difference between Access, which, which basically puts everything here and hides all of that. Whereas with this, these are all different interfaces that they deal with and the rest of this is hidden. All right, so this is a quick screenshot to show you when you're gonna be using MySQL, the querying view. Um, you don't really need to know this until next term. Just, uh, not next term, but uh, after the break, the next half. Uh, but we decided to include a slide here just so that in the future, you guys have an idea what these buttons do. 
Um, essentially, you've got the bit on the left that shows you your database structure. Uh, you've got a spot where you can type in queries. You've got your results here. And there's a little lightning bolt right about there. Uh, that lets you run the queries. That's the interface for MySQL. That's the administration tool, not the interface the user would see. That's the view the database person looks at. Okay. How far in are we? Uh, it doesn't tell me anymore. All right. So there are, when you're doing database design, like I said, today was an information dump. It's just getting rid of the boring stuff on the first day, get it out of the way. So there's three types of database design. So when you're designing databases, there's three types. There's from existing data. So somebody comes up to you and says, I need a new database. They give you reams of paper. And based on these reams of paper, you're going to design a new database. Some of this data might come from other databases. Maybe you are extracting data from salesforce.com and you need to put it in something internal and we don't have anything to hold that yet. So we're going to create a database for it. So we need to take the data that they're, we're given, analyze it, make a design, do proper normalization, that kind of thing, and bam, database. Um, new system development. Um, that's the fun one. That somebody went off on a vision quest, got some great idea, comes back and say, I want a database that does this. So you're going to be given specifications, requirements. You're saying, oh, I want to have a database that does this, 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 and this. We need to track names. We need to track addresses, date of birth, uh, you know, favorite food, that kind of stuff, whatever reason. Uh, you want to track that. And you're going to design requirements. You're going to take those requirements, turn them into a model, take the model, convert that into a design. You're going to model each piece of information and then turn it into a design. And then there's the dreaded database redesign. That's the worst one. So you got an old database and you need a new database. And you need to migrate the data from one system to another system. If you're lucky, you get to create the new database so that you have a lot of control over what happens. Uh, or you're integrating two different databases. So suddenly a company you work for buys out a small competitor, they've got their own database, and you need to migrate their database into your database, or maybe you need to take the two, put them together in a room, and out comes another database somewhere. Uh, usually, you know several years later. And so this one, what you do is you call it something called reverse engineering. So you take what's there, you just, you look at what's there, you figure out what, how it's put together, and you design it based on what you've discovered in the structure. Uh, you're going to create more transformations. In other words, you can take the data from one format to another format, that kind of thing. Uh, database redesign really sucks. It's not a good time. because you'll always make a mistake. No matter what you do, you're going to make a mistake. And then you realize that you just have to redo a month's worth of work because of a stupid mistake. Um, some people enjoy it. Some people don't. Um, you know. So the structured design life cycle. So, so you guys in later on in this program, you're going to learn about the software development life cycle, which also happens to strangely have the exact same letters as, as DLC. Um, so software development life cycle, there's also the structured design life cycle. Uh, they are very similar in the sense that they do the same thing. So it starts with you assess your needs, you decide if it's feasible, as in is the person that requests this out to lunch? Is it ridiculous? Um, you may generate alternatives. In other words, they want some. They want a whole new database, but you know about another product that's like ninety-five percent good enough. That's an alternative. Maybe you know, creating your own database and the application, and everything might cost two hundred thousand dollars of you know software, labor, et cetera, et cetera. 
or you could buy something off the shelf that does 95% of the job for $10,000. There's some, you know, alternatives. Uh, so you evaluate the different alternatives, whether it's creating from scratch, buying something off the shelf, paying someone else to modify something off the shelf, and you're going to pick something. You do the design, you develop, you test, you implement. So in other words, then you launch it at your users. You evaluate how well it went. And then you're back to assessing your needs. It just keeps going and going and going in a giant circle. The, this is the exact same thing. Just this is the waterfall view. Instead of a circle, it just goes down the waterfall. Each of the steps are the same. Okay. Um, hey, made it in an hour and 15 minutes. So to wrap things up, we say review the course textbook. So what I'll be doing is I'll be publishing um, pages to read as part of the announcements. I don't remember the pages off the top of my head. But there's certain page ranges that you should read to cover. That having been said, the tests are not based on the textbook. They're based on the slide decks. But the textbook is there to help round things out. So if I said something and you didn't understand it in class, the textbook may explain it to you in a different way. It's not a bad thing. Um, make sure you study the hybrid tasks as needed. Um, and make sure you keep up to date on all your due dates. Um, and I'm going to give you guys a quick tour of Brightspace so that you guys know where everything is for this course. Okay, so you guys have probably looked at Brightspace by now, so you already have an idea where things are roughly. Uh, announcements. I will be putting up announcements every day. Well, not every day, every week. Whoa, not every day. Every week. In this announcement, it will say, this is what is due. This is when it's due. This is what you should read. Uh, there'll be a link for the recording and a few other miscellaneous. Like if I did an example in class and I took pictures of the board, which I made depending on how time goes, I'll be posting the pictures in the announcements. Um, under content, you will see most of the stuff in here. So contact information and class times. Um, you know, this shows you who is where and at what time. Uh, for each of your lab sections. Uh, course information, that's the usual stuff here. Weekly lecture material. Now, my view is different from your guys' view. You'll notice there's a little, probably a little more on my screen than your screen. Uh, but the weekly lecture material will have the week-by-week -week breakdown of everything you need to learn, uh, including lecture slides as applicable. Under... Uh, recordings, which there's nothing there right now, is where you're going to find the links to the recordings of the lecture, right? Um, but I will also have a link in the announcement so you can get at it. Um, labs. Under lab exercises, you have all your labs. And literally, in my case, they're all there. You guys, you know, can't see them all, but they're there. And that's where you find that stuff. Uh, under assignments, which I'm not going to put up on the screen yet, no point pay, making people panic on week one. Um, the assignments, it says four, there's only two. There's just, depending on how we are organize the groups, we use one set or the other set for you guys to look at. Um, hybrids are where you are going to do your tasks. I'll be publishing the dates and that kind of thing uh, as needed. Um, under the calendar, you can see when the things are due. So you can see when everything is due. It's not a mystery. Um, under activities, you have your assignments and your quizzes, but the quizzes are where the hybrids are. And that is mostly what you guys need to see inside of Brightspace for this course. Uh, as you need stuff, it will appear. As you don't need stuff anymore, I'm not going to make it disappear, but you know what I mean? Like it's just, it's going to be there historically. And uh, 
yeah, yeah. So that's what I needed to cover today. Um, I'll be uploading the recording probably tomorrow at some point during the day. Um, as long as I remember to do it. I don't get sideswiped into too many meetings. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll push that up. And that's it for today. Um, next week, we will start actually talking about database design, actual database design. I'm now done traumatizing you over the concepts that the, you know, the database servers out there know everything about you. You can all have your own nightmares on that. But outside of that, that's it. Uh, you guys are free to run. And I'll see uh, you guys either in lab on Tuesday or in lecture Wednesday. Yes. Yeah, it's uh, specifically uh, those that have Wander. <laughs> the uh, section 333, they went and scheduled them. They, they had a conflict on a schedule, so they moved the class. Uh, congratulations, whoever has Wander for a lab prof has class at 8 o'clock at night on Fridays. I guarantee he's going to have high attendance. <laughs>